नमो नारायणाय नमो नारायणाय हेलो डिवोटीज ऑफ शिकागो कालीबारी वी आर टुडे गोइंग टू हैव द second of the series of lectures on the essentials of sanatana dharma by mr sundareshan professor sundareshan subramanyam and his wife vidya subramanyam mr subramanyam is an environmental engineer and a scientist and has done lot of research on hinduism and sanatana dharma and the vedas and upanishads and other literatures he is very well versed in sanskrit and vidya is a devotional singer and a homemaker and she will be joining with him in this endeavor again with this let me hand over the mic to mr sundareshan subramanyam thank you नमस्ते टू ऑल वेलकम टू सेशन टू ऑफ दिस सीरीज ऑन द एसेंशियल्स ऑफ सनातन धर्म वी कमेंट्स विथ अवर यूजल प्रेयर्स शंकराचार्य मध्य In our first session last week, Sri Sampatayanga mentioned that uh, I had built the foundation for this series. But really speaking, the foundation is not yet complete. It is in the stages of building. so today we will start with an overview of our last session and continue further to learn some of the fundamental aspects related to sanatana dharma i am going to show you a series of slides and will amplify each point in my talk we'll start with a basic question and also the answer that we had given last session we asked the question what is sanatana dharma and i explained that it is to be the eternal natural way in consonance with nature and it is a religion which had no name not founded by anybody therefore there was no particular name for it until the foreigners who came across the river indus and they termed the religion as hinduism followed by the people called hindus what is the holy book of the vedas i mentioned an acceptable holy book for all sections of hindus is the vedas the ancient scriptures of knowledge coming from the root with to know so the holy book itself is called knowledge 
and the core belief of Sanatana Dharma is Sarvam Brahma Mayam Jagat. The whole universe is spread by Brahma or the Almighty. And the goal of Sanatana Dharma is the well being of all. So, this is what we talked about in the last session. Today, in this session, I am going to tell you more about the fundamental concepts which are ingrained in Sanatana Dharma so that you have a better foundation to build the superstructure. So what is a religion? There are different kinds of definitions and uh, according to the philologist Max Muller in the 19th century, he said the word English word religion came from the Latin word called religio that was used to mean reverence for God or the gods and careful pondering of divine things. Wikipedia says the religion word comes from the Latin word ligare, which means to join or link, classically understood to mean the linking of human and the divine. So there are different meanings given, but people believe in religion for some reason, and that reason or the question what makes people believe in religion has really plagued many great thinkers for many centuries. Karl Marx, for example, called religion the opium of the people. Anyway, besides all those definitions, to put it in very simple words, it is that which shows us a way out of our miserable life of repeated births and deaths, which is again a unique concept in Hinduism that people are reborn, incarnation again and again, and, and leads us to go away from that miserable rebirth, but leads us to eternal happiness. The purpose of religion itself is to overcome sorrow and be happy. You see people when they go to temple or go to the gurus, saints, they share their woes, they share their sorrows, and in turn seek solutions from them. So it looks like that a religion, even Sanatana Dharma is intended to provide solutions to sorrows in human life. I recall long ago when I went to Jaipur, there were many temples and there was a small wayside temple not really very big, but it had a, a board which read, please come, God is inside waiting for you to solve your problems. And it was quite nice to see that because the pujari or priest probably wanted to assure people that the God is waiting there to solve their problems. So Sanatana Dharma is something where it believes God is within you as Jivatma, as they call it, which is a part of Paramatma, the Supreme Soul. It's a concept which is very strong in Sanatana Dharma. I'm going to tell you how this concept has evolved and what are all the sayings from different scriptures. It is much more than a religion. It is a culture. It's a way of life. It's a code of conduct and behavior with universal goals. So everybody talks about God in some way or other. Some believe in the existence of God. Some don't. But Hinduism accepts both the philosophies. In fact, Charuakam or atheism in short was accepted as a system in India. So the concept is uh, quite unique. The belief that God is not far away, living in a remote heaven, 
but exists inside each and every being, every living being as Jivatma or soul as we describe in English. I'd like to give you a simple example. You know, these days, uh, morning, you have the dew forming on the lawns. And when the sun rises, the bright sun, the reflection of the sun is seen in the small dew on the grass. And they all sparkle like diamonds. So there is one big sun and you see hundreds of those small suns getting reflected in those dew points. So Sanatana Dharma is something similar where the Paramatma is like a sun and he's being transmitted to the Jivatma, which are like small dews and they're reflecting. So it is a huge almighty which gets reflected in every living being as a small Jivatma. So that is a concept of God. But how is it really supported by these scriptures? There are what is called the Mahavakyas, the great sayings that you have. And these are all from the Vedas, which I mentioned earlier is the book of knowledge. And there are four principal ones. We'll talk about these Vedas in detail later on, but I just want to quote one, one line which are called the Mahavakyas from the Vedas, starting from the Rig Veda, Prajnanam Brahma, which means it is the insight is Brahman or the Brahman is consciousness, Brahma, meaning the Almighty. From Atharva Veda, you have I am Atma Brahma. The self is Brahman, which is again pointing towards you. The third is taken from Sama Veda, Tatvam Asi. Tat is that. Last time we had a slokam on that. That, that referring to the Almighty by whatever name you call it. Tatvam Asi. That essence are you. Thou art that. And lastly, Yajurveda, which proclaims Aham Brahmasmi. I am Brahman. I am the Jivatma and Brahman. So there are many, many such Mahavakyas. To give you some more examples, there is Sarvam Kalvidam Brahma. All this surely Brahman. And there is also from the Isha Upanishad, Isha Vasyamidam Sarva. The whole universe is enveloped by Isha. Ishvara, this Vopanam Mantra of Ishvopanishad. There is another one called Ekam Sat Vipra Bahuda Vadanti. Ekam Sat, truth is just one. But the wise people, they speak of it differently. They call it by different names. So, Sarvam Brahmamayam Jagat. Everything in this universe is Brahman. They all express the same insight that the individual self or the jiva, which appears to be a separate existence, is actually, in essence, a part and manifestation of the whole Brahman. So this is a concept which is unique, that you don't have to really go out anywhere. It's extremely subtle. It's a conscious basis of everything. It means the God is within you. Don't we greet each other by saying a simple namaste? We put our hands together and say namaste. What does it mean? It literally means namoha. I bow to you. And te is means you. Which is really a soul greeting another soul. So, there is a divine spark in each of us and that serves as an acknowledgement of the soul. It is done in a way where you don't touch anyone. There is no human touch. It is just with folded hands. You don't shake hands. 
you don't hug anybody no human touch and it is absolutely very important now in the pandemic age when you are not supposed to touch anyone you are a mask but this has been the the greeting has been there for thousands of years in fact there is a lot of stress given to the hygiene part in our life in many of these ancient scriptures i am just going to quote you one from the famous vishnu sahasranamam where the palasruti you get one called sarvagamana bhajara pratamam parikalpate achara prabho dharmo dharmasya pravrachutah sarvagamana achara pratamam parikalpate the very first thing which came was acharam which is a sense of hygiene code of contact and behavior not to really physically touch anyone some people call it as untouchability but today isn't it prevalent all over do we call untouchability no we keep it safety right it is safe for people this safety was prescribed thousands of years back in vishnu sahasranamam that this is the first thing which came sarvagamanam achara prathamam parikalpate it was the first thing which came and achara prabhu dharmah after that only dharma came and dharma's prabhu was achuta so the knowing that god is within you is giving you a very nice feeling and uh, uh, it leads uh, into inquiry about yourself and ultimately lead you to the bliss of self realization so i want to support this as sarva brahmamayam jagat with a, a nice composition song by sadashiva brahmendra he was one of the greatest saints from south india who lived in the early 18th century during the time of sarboji maharaja in tanjavur the maharashtrian king and he was a great saint and he composed many many beautiful songs and there is one which talks about sarvam brahmamayam i am going to ask simriti vidya subramanyam to sing this song sarvam brahmamayam ब्रह्मय ब्रह्मय जनीय जनीय 
What a beautiful song. I'd like to explain the meaning of this in the context of Sarvam Brahmamayam. Sadashiva Brahmendra says the very first line, Sarvam Brahmamayam Re Re, which is equivalent to saying, Hey, hey, you know, we call somebody as hey, hey. So he says, hey, hey, everything is Brahmamayam. All filled with the supreme power. Kim Vachaniyam, Kima Vachaniyam. Vachanam means what is spoken. Kim Vachaniyam, what is spoken. Kima Vachaniyam, A Vachaniyam. When you put A, before a word in Sanskrit becomes the opposite, like nyaya becomes anyaya, krama becomes akrama. Similarly, here avachaniyam means what is spoken and what is not spoken. Kim rachaniyam, kim rachaniyam. What is written or created or produced, and what is not written or produced. Kim pataniyam. Patanam means to read or learn. Even in Hindi, it is the same word, Patnaya. It's also called Patam. A lesson is called Patam. So, Kim Pataniyam, Kim Pataniyam. What can be learned and what cannot be learned? Kim Bhajaniyam. Bhajan means Bhajan, we sing, right? So, what is what can be sung and what cannot be sung? Kim Bodhavyam. Bodh means teaching. What can be taught? And Kim Bodhavyam. What cannot be taught? Bhoktavyam. Bhogam means pleasure, enjoy. What can be enjoyed and what cannot be enjoyed? Sarvatra Sada Hamsa Dhyanam. Always be in that Hamsa Dhyanam. Hamsa is a a style of meditation. I'll explain to you what it means. Mukti Nidhanam. It leads you to Mukti or liberation or salvation. What is Hamsa? You know, Hamsa is the name of a bird. It is a swan. Some of you might have seen that. It's a beautiful bird. It is equally at home on land as well as in water. Similarly, a true sage or a saint is equally at home in the realms of matter and of spirit, physically and mentally both, to be in always divine ecstasy. At the same time, be wakeful in the Paramahamsa stage. So the royal swan it really floats in the cosmic ocean, beholding both the body and the ocean as manifestations of the same spirit. So Paramahamsa is a height of high spiritual development in which the union with the ultimate reality is attained by a sannyasi or a saint. Ramakrishna is called Paramahamsa, the supreme Hamsa. So the message conveyed by this song, it's a lovely song, is that do not waste your energy into unnecessary arguments 
on what is right or wrong, what should be learned or what should not be learned, what should be done or undone, but focus on praying to the Almighty with the meditation, Brahman, to attain salvation or self-realization. That is, in a nutshell, the message conveyed by this little song. So, what it means is Hinduism or Sanatana Dharma focus us on you, you, the individual, the development of yourself, because the Jivatma is within you. In India, with the wealth of uh, spiritual tradition, many, many saints, hundreds of them, very spiritual giants. And one of the greatest was Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, who lived in the 19th century, 1836 to 1886. His life was a testament to truth, universality, love, and purity. He was a very simple person. He often said, human beings were the highest manifestations of God. And today you have, by his grace, many educational institutions, Ramakrishna Mission, which is housing and make big buildings in any place in the world. They have educational centers and they have many saints in that order, Ramakrishna order, who are spreading Savanathana Dharma. So I'd like to quote Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, who says, God is within you. He says, I'm quoting him. Do you know what I see? He says, I see him as all. See him means the almighty. Men and other creatures appear to me only as hollow forms, moving their heads and hands and feet. But within is the Lord himself. So you realize that the greatest truth here in Sanatana Dharma is don't go searching around, but look at yourself because the Lord is within you. And his greatest sishya or disciple was Swami Vivekananda, who came, a Hindu, all the way sailing to America. And then he was given a chance to speak at the Hindu forum, the religious forum, in which he began his speech, not as ladies and gentlemen, but brothers and sisters of America. First time someone calling everybody as brothers and sisters. And the people who had congregated were stunned to listen to him. And they allotted a lot more time than what was originally given to him. And he established Hinduism in America. So the focus being on you, Swami Vivekananda, you see in the picture, he says, you have to go, grow from the inside out. None can teach you. None can make you spiritual. There is no other teacher but your own soul. Says Swami Vivekananda, one of the well-known and the greatest leaders of Hinduism or Sanatana Dharma. So you see, the focus is on you. And what he said is supported by the Vedas, which says there is one supreme ruler, the inmost self of all beings, who makes his one form manifold. The eternal happiness belongs to the wise who perceive him within themselves, not to others. So, in a nutshell, Sanatana Dharma concentrates on you. Not really, you can say there are thousands of gods and there are many temples and all that. They are all only instruments for you to focus on yourself. Going further on this, I'm going to talk to you about happiness. What is happiness? Now, everybody wants to pursue it. They want to use religion as a lever to get rid of the sorrows, to unload 
all the burden they are carrying in their heart and they want to become happy. So you see, I mentioned before, when you go to temple, you pray for the welfare. When you meet a, a saint, you, you share your sorrows with him and say, I want my daughter to get married. I want a good job. I want to go abroad. Whatever is your desire or whatever you, your challenge feeling and you want their blessings. In other words, you want to unburden yourself. So the goal is really to be happy. But what is happiness? Is it really something which a material can bring in? You buy something new, you car, a home or a dress or whatever. Does that happiness remain eternal? No, it's only temporary. It is not a thing. It is a state of mind. You feel happy when you acquire something. Let's say I get an Apple iPhone. Well, I feel happy. It's a state of mind for some time. After that, it goes away. And then it goes to something else. So it is something which must be lived. So how to be happy is a big question. It's a million dollar question. There are hundreds of books written on this subject. But Sanatana Dharma shows a simple way. It shows the way. And I would like to tell you more about how it shows the way. The way to happiness as prescribed by Sanatana Dharma, it is actually fourfold as you see. It leads you through one, knowledge. Knowledge acquired from the Vedas. And the Vedas is very extensive scriptures, enormous. We'll cover some of it a little later. But it is something which is being talked about since thousands of years and so many experts, philosophers, saints have spoken about it. And it's a very vast subject like an ocean. We can't obviously cover it in the series, but highlights of it I'd like to give you later on. But they are the ocean and it's a fountain of knowledge from which many things are learned. They are like a treatise which can help you to steer through your life. That's number one. Second, discipline. Discipline is absolutely required. In not only in individual, in families, in communities, in countries. Without discipline, it is very difficult to progress because it will be haywire. So here, it's a rigorous discipline taught by Sanatana Dharma in terms of physical as well as mental discipline, which will encompass various activities, like rituals. Some may think it's a burden some, but not really so. They are intended to train your mind. If you want to get up early in the morning to do a ritual, which makes you the discipline of waking up early. So you have rituals and Things like yoga, which gives you physical as well as mental exercises. For example, meditation is something connected to the mind. But then when you do asanas, they are physical. So that is number two path. Third, which is most important, especially in present times, is character. Building up character in those days, in India, they had the Gurukulam system where there used to be a guru and then some students, not a very large group, maybe a small group of people who are very humble. The students were taught humility and they were taught to work within the family of the Gurukulam, fend for themselves and also for the family of the guru. And in the process, they also learned many things, including development of character. So what is meant by character? It is a quality. And Sanatana Dharma prescribes five of them, five essential qualities. The first one being Ahimsa. Ahimsa means non-violence. Non-violence, not only in body, but also in mind. What do you mean by mind? When you say mind, you don't talk harsh. The whole of Sanskrit language, there is not a single swear word. You cannot hurt anyone by calling him names. You have to be polite. 
that is one of the qualities ahimsa you should not kill anyone we should not bodily harm anyone you should not mentally hurt anyone this is one of the five qualities second is satya satya means truth as you know be truthful be truthful to others and also to yourself be honest with yourself this is a very important quality it is taught right from young age third is asatheya asatheya means non stealing or not wanting to take somebody else's property another important thing you should not commit frauds you should not aspire for someone else's property or materials asatheya fourth is saucham which is also very important in current times of pandemic saucham means cleanliness cleanliness was one of the most important qualities stressed in sanatan dharma right from the beginning i did mention that slogan from vishnu sarasanamam which said that acharam pratikalpita the first one came acharam so that is a, an important quality even today if more important because of the pandemic that one should maintain cleanliness take bath every day make sure that you have clean clothes these are all cleanliness part of cleanliness hygiene safety and lastly indriya nigraham as they call it control of senses it's very difficult for people to have tight control but that was taught as a quality so you have this character as a very important part of self development and these are all taught in the gurukulam and finally looking at yourself self introspection as i call it it is something which comes a little later in life the first three being continuous because there is a pyramid of gradually climbing up in stages dharmartha kama moksha as i call it so like the maslow's theory of hierarchy you have the top apex which is self realization or salvation so that again is the final part of this which includes thinking deep meditation it includes love for all compassion for all kindness respect for others you will find these qualities in many saints because they have attained that apex level but it is taught right from the child they engage to respect others and gradually continue with that tradition like you have matr devo bhava pitru devo bhava acharya devo bhava respect your mother respect your father respect your teacher these are all fundamental part of sanatan dharma which are taught right from childhood so that the child when he grows he develops a good character and is able to think for himself independently on how to remain happy himself you find that is why you find many of the saints they are they are in supreme bliss they don't get perturbed or rattled by many challenges that come in there are so many of them ramakrishna paramsa was one vivekananda was one adi sankaracharya today we have sankaracharya we have ramanuja acharya they were all great saints who had that unique quality in them complete bliss happiness so they are all living beings who demonstrated these four steps by themselves so that others can follow so going a little further we talk about creatures that we say all sanatan dharma wishes well for all creatures but what's the difference between us and animals both are creatures right 
what really sets them apart? There's only one thing which sets them apart and that is a human mind. Because the human mind works differently. It has different frequencies and it has a different content. It has got a variety of desires and constant thoughts about future. What is going to happen tomorrow? We have calendars, we plan activities far in advance. We have countless desires. Look at a cow there in the picture. The cow doesn't have any problems. It doesn't think about which restaurant to go, what to eat there, should we eat masala dosa or a burger or a sandwich, no problem. When you see in a restaurant, you people, many people have this problem of choosing what they want to eat, whether this or that. The cow doesn't worry about where to send the school, uh, the kid to school, which school. Uh, the cow doesn't have to plan about college education for the kid. So these are all things which bother the human mind. And their desires, there are also problems associated with it. It's a fact that they will come one day when we want to separate from these desires. These objects of affection which separate us. If we are able to somehow dissociate with those desires, gradually you will find that your mind is getting happy. So the number of desires you have is directly proportional to the number of uh, causes of sorrows that we experience every day. But so you reduce your desire to some extent, then your sorrow will also reduce this proportionately. And eventually you will find you are leading to some kind of a happiness. So the man is constantly engaged in this pursuit. What is seen today is poor management of one's own self. And spiritual poverty is at the core of our sufferings. I want to give you one simple example. Assume there is a man who has a lot of farming land and he finds that the yields are not so good. So he said, I want to sell it. So he sells the land to somebody else. Maybe a couple of years later, he finds the other man who has bought the land from him the yields are boosted up and the land starts giving him a lot of returns. And then it leads to the original owner thinking, oh, when I was the owner, this land he did not give me so much yield. But look, it is somebody else's property. Now it is giving so much of yield and he is he's, uh, really floating in a lot of money. The same piece of land which was once a source of happiness for him because it was his property, now becomes an object of sorrow for him because he compares. Why? Because the feeling of mine is lost. The ownership is gone. It is somebody else's owner. Same case, supposing you have a, a, a car and you want to sell it and you get a good price for it because it was giving you some trouble. And the man who bought it, he runs it beautifully. He says, I have no problem at all. So if it's that man's same car, he's running it beautifully. But while I was having it, it gave me trouble. I don't know how that man is profited by me. So everything is related to the possession. So once the possession is gone and somebody else is enjoying that, your mind starts thinking differently. And this is very, very typical in human mind. That is what is setting the animals and humans apart. So animals, they are not confined. They are, they are confined to only their food and then their living environment. They are quite happy. But human mind is not like that. So controlling the human mind and to lead it to what you call happiness, means that he has to control his senses. That, the four paths I mentioned, they are the four paths which are shown by Sanatana Dharma to gradually increase your knowledge, your character, the quality of thinking, 
in the quality of managing yourself, understanding the self by yourself, that leads you to eventually happiness. So Sanatana Dharma, in short, leads you to happiness in the perfect way. So going further, I want to really share with you what is called a Shanti Mantra. Now Shanti Mantra, what is a mantra? This is a very common word that we hear these days. It is also part of the English dictionary. It is also used in management circles as management mantra or marketing mantra. And even the word guru is also used. So I love to explain what is the meaning of mantra. In Sanskrit, we say, manana trayate iti mantraha. Tra is the verb for protection. Like uh, in Vishnu Sahasranamam, you have a yeah, verse called Paritranaya Sadhu Nam Vinasa Chatushkritam Dharma Samstaba Narthaya Sambhabhami Yuge Yuge Dharma Samstaba Narthaya to establish Dharma. What I will do? Paritranaya Sadhu Nam. I will protect the sadhus, the innocent ones. But I will punish Paritranaya Sadhu Nam Vinasa Chatushkritam. I will Punish the evil guys. And Bhagavan himself says that. So, tra is the verb to protect. And mantra, just said, manana trayate iti mantraha. That one which by constant recitation in your mind protects you, that is called mantra. So, there are different kinds of mantras. You have Gayatri mantra, you have got several other mantras. In Vedam, you have got many, many mantras. Rudram is one mantra. Your Purusha Suktam, you got mantra. So by constant recitation, it gives you the protection to yourself. So this is called Shanti Mantra, which is the mantra which leads you to peace. The reason why I'm saying this is that it reflects the core of Sanatana Dharma, which is meaning well for everybody. I mentioned it last time also, the quality of Sanatana Dharma is this universality, it is applied to everyone. It doesn't distinguish between a Hindu or a non-Hindu, or a man or a woman. No, it's the same applicable to all, and that is the best part of it. So, in this one, I'm going to recite this mantra. It says, Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramayaha Sarve Badrani Pashantu Makasti Dukna Bhagavad Om Shanti 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 Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha. Now, a little knowledge of Sanskrit will help you to understand this very beautifully. But the words are very simple. Sarve is everybody, all. Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha. Sukhinaha means be happy. May all be happy. See the very first line. It says, may all be happy. Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha. It doesn't discriminate anybody. Sarve Santu Niramayaha. Let all be free from any disease or illness. Praying. To so say this daily, you will be free from all illnesses. I'll tell you. <laughs> Sarve Santu Niramayaha. You let everybody be free from any kind of sickness or illness or diseases. Third. Sarve Badrani Pashantu. Let all see what is auspicious. Pashantu means seeing. Badra means auspiciousness. Let all see what is auspicious. Ma Kaschi Dukkha Bhag Bhavet. Very beautifully said. May nobody, no one suffer or feel sad. 
See again, kaschite, none, nobody should feel sad or suffer. Om Shanti 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 It says peace, peace, peace. Can you find a mantra which is any better to wish the entire world, all the living beings, the best of everything, free from diseases and full of happiness, and see all what is auspiciousness, and nobody should have any kind of suffering or sadness. This is the core, core belief of Sanatana Dharma, that it does not distinguish whether you're a short man, you're a black man, or a white man, or a brown man, or a, uh, a man, or a woman, or a kid, or an animal, it doesn't distinguish. It looks everybody with the same eyes, this is a simple five line mantra, but there are hundreds and thousands of such mantras. The Vedas are positive throughout. It generates positive energy in you just by listening to them. The vibrations produced by them, they have such an impact on your nervous system that you feel confident of facing any challenge in life. That is the secret of Sanatana Dharma. So, in conclusion, I want to tell you this Shantri Mantra and then uh, you may have some uh, questions or you have any comments or any suggestions. You're most welcome to send me an email or contact Sri Sampatayangar who is coordinating this program and we'll try to answer them and provide you some feedback on that. But I would welcome your comments because we want to uh, tailor the series, design the program in such a way that it meets with your expectation and what you're really looking for. And I would welcome your feedback in that regard. So I'm going to give you the contact in the last slide I want to thank you for the listening patiently for this session number two. So here is my email contact, gurujesubi at gmail.com. And stay tuned for the next session number three, which will be your next Sunday, same time, 5 p.m. Central Time CST. With that, I'd like to conclude session number two today. Thank you very much and namaste. Thanks a lot, Mr. Subramaniam, and also Vidya. Been an excellent presentation. Last time you just laid the foundation. Now you are bringing in the bricks of gold and platinum. <laughs> with the Kohinoor diamonds and the sapphire and rubies, which are all kind of uh, quotations from Vedas, Upanishads, uh, and other scriptures. That's what it is, beautifully presented, and the building is coming slowly. And as he said, these sessions you know, will be more fruitful if there is an interaction through questions, we have, you know, in Kalibari, Facebook, the comment session. Do comment there, you know, that one or write to Kalibari, write to Subramaniam, or write to me, uh, or through questions. Uh, we will be careful in reading that and forwarding it to Mr. Subramaniam. And every question and doubt of yours is answered, you know. Unless Arjuna is asking those things, you know, Gita would never have <laughs> been like that. <laughs> you have to bring in questions. That's what it is. Every aspect of it, the question is. Sanatana Dharma, unlike any other religion, questions are allowed. You know, Sishyas used to ask questions to Acharya. And even devotees used to ask questions to God. You know, Krishna never mind the matter of questions being asked. You know, that one. That is the beauty of the Sanatana Dharma also, you know. 
So please do that one. I again, once again, thank you, Mr. Subramaniam and Vidya, and looking forward for our next session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Happy New Year to everybody in advance. Yeah, stay safe and uh, that one meet you after the new year. Thank you. Thank you.